Good morning and welcome to this service of worship from Drumball Reform Presbyterian Church. Once again coming to you via YouTube. Just a couple of announcements before we proceed. The first announcement is with regard to the Northern Presbytery prayer meeting, 1st of March, it will be held via Zoom at 7.30. It's for all members. Contact details can be obtained from either Leslie or Stanley. Secondly, please remember the evening service this evening, as usual. Uh, the theme for our service this evening is Jacob overcoming his fears. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 14, verse 5. That verse tells us, God is present in the company of the righteous. God is present in the company of the righteous. So pause and think about that and take that on board as we come now to worship God. He is present in the company of the righteous. Our opening psalm of praise sung for us is Psalm 5 and the whole psalm will be sung. Later on we'll be thinking about Jacob and the wonderful prayer that he prayed when he was really up against it. And in the fifth psalm we hear the psalmist in a, in a similar way speaking about bringing his fears, bringing his worries to the Lord. The psalm begins with a, a plea for God to listen to the words of his prayer. He talks about sighs, he talks about crying, he uh, asks the Lord to please help him at this time. And he says, in answer to my prayers, I'm waiting expectantly because God is a God who draws near to his people. He's in the, as we said, the, in the company of the righteous. God, says the psalmist, uh, has no time for the proud, the, the liars, the deceivers. But in his wonderful grace, his people draw near to him and he accepts their worship. He's conscious that he's surrounded by enemies, people who have no time for God. You can't rely on them. They're deceivers, he says. But what about those who have trusted in the Lord? They are full of praise. They are shouting for joy because God is about to pour out a blessing on them as they gather for worship. He is there to protect his people. He is there to surround his people. He is there to bless his people. So let us claim that blessing in Psalm 5, the whole psalm, and the tune is Morning Light.
Let us pray. Listen to my words, O Lord, and my sighs before you lay. Hear my cry, my King, my God, help me, for to you I pray. With the morning light, O Lord, you will hear my voice, my plea. In the morning I will pray, and I'll wait expectantly. Loving Heavenly Father, we draw near in the attitude of prayer. We come to you, our Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking the help of the Holy Spirit who helps our weaknesses in prayer. Lord, as the psalmist said, you have no delight in evil. You have no delight in the the proud or the liars. You have no time for those who have taken their stand against you and against your word. They are deceivers. And yet, O Lord, the psalmist speaks of abundant grace. And because of that abundant grace shown to him, he says, I draw near. I draw near, I come close. And uh, he says, what do I come close to do? Well, to praise. He's trusting in the Lord. He knows the Lord will watch over him. He takes refuge in God and in God's promises. And he waits for the blessing of God to be poured out that blessing that surrounds them, protects them, shields them. So, Lord, we pray that you would pour out that blessing upon us today, the blessing that you poured out on the psalmist. Lord, we open our hearts to receive that blessing from you today. We open our minds and we open our lips to praise you, our loving Heavenly Father. We do so in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We come now to our scripture reading. And once again, we're in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 32. And we read from verse 1 to verse 21. This is the word of the living God. Jacob went on his way. And the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, This is what you are to say to my master Esau. Your servant, Jacob, says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, men servants and maid servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favour in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to meet your brother Esau, And now he is coming to meet you, and four hundred men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will certainly make you prosper 
and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. Two hundred female goats and twenty male goats, two hundred ewes and twenty rams, thirty female camels with their young, forty cows and ten bulls, twenty-five donkeys and ten male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, Go ahead of me, and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, When my brother Esau meets you and asks, To whom do you belong and where are you going, and who owns all these animals in front of you? Then you are to say, They belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second, the third, and all the others who followed the herds. You are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and be sure to say, Your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. And we'll end our reading at that 21st verse. We know that God will add his blessing to his infallible and inerrant word. We come now to our second psalm, which will be sung for us. It's Psalm 56, and the verses are 3 to 9, and the tune, Weather Be. Now, in our study of the life of Jacob, this morning we see that he has come to a time of crisis. His brother, whom he has wronged all those years, before is now coming with 400 men it all looks very ominous and uh, we read he is overcome by great fear and distress and the psalmist was like that in our psalm today psalm 56 but the portion begins when i am afraid I'll trust in you. And he keeps repeating that. I I will trust and not be afraid. I will trust. I will not give way to fear. The psalmist says he's in a very difficult situation. There There are his enemies twisting his words, making life difficult for him, plotting against them. And He says, I just am overcome virtually by it all. He talks about uh, his troubled thoughts. He talks about his tears. He he mentions about a little bottle uh, where the tears uh, of grieving are recorded. We know that these little bottles did exist in the ancient Near East all those years ago. But the psalmist says, not only have you Put my tears into that little bottle, but you've recorded what is happening to me in your book. So nothing is happening apart from your knowledge. You know exactly what's going on. And so, Lord, he says, will you take away fear, especially fear of the last great enemy? And then on a note of of triumph at the end of the psalm, he says, You have delivered me from death. You've kept my feet so that I can walk before you, walk with you in the light of life. Psalm 56, verses 3 to the end. June Weatherby.
Let us pray. O Lord, our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, as we turn to this wonderful portion of your word just now, we pray that you would open up for us your word. We thank you that you have given us your word through your Holy Spirit. We thank you that it is a word that instructs us. It's a word that explains to us your ways and your way of salvation. It's a word which is precious. May it be precious to us as we hear your voice speaking in it today. We thank you that the psalmist had learned to trust. As we think of Jacob, still in many ways depending on his own cleverness to get him out of a situation that is threatening, he had to learn to trust in you and we must learn that too Heavenly Father so teach us from your word and grant that after our study together we will know ourselves to be helped encouraged strengthened and blessed so Father we pray that you would draw near to us now and grant us a sense of your nearness and grant us the help of your spirit that unction of the spirit for we ask it in Jesus name Amen we continue in our study of the life of Jacob so I would ask you please to turn with me to Genesis chapter 32 and verses 9 to 12 where we read about Jacob's prayer. That's our theme today. Jacob's prayer. Last time we thought about Jacob planning to be reconciled with his brother Esau. He sends some people on ahead to meet with Esau and then he gets the alarming news that Esau is coming to meet him and he has these 400 men with him. So the thing that he has dreaded so long and thought about so long and no doubt spent many sleepless nights over, it's all happening now. It's all coming to a head now. Jacob, in the midst of of his fear prays then Jacob prayed 
So we will look in detail here at verses 9 to 12, the details of the prayer. Now we know how James in the New Testament tells us in his letter in chapter 5 verse 17, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And this prayer of Jacob's is a wonderful prayer. Indeed, some have called this a model of its kind. It rests securely, says one commentator, on the foundation of covenant promise. It shows the true spirit of worship in its wonder at God's mercy beyond all deserving. And its urgent request reveals a man no longer full of self-sufficiency. And so its acknowledged fear is exposed to the remembered promise. End quote. So there's a lot for us to learn from here because prayer is absolutely crucially important in our lives too. But by way of introduction, let's just think about the alarm before the prayer. I mentioned earlier we'll be looking, God willing, more closely at Jacob's struggles that he had with fear when he shouldn't really have had those struggles. But just look at the alarm And people can get themselves into a state of alarm. Fear can overtake them. Fear can threaten to overwhelm them. And so we read, In great fear and distress, Jacob prayed. As one commentator puts it, Jacob was beside himself with fear. And so, It was an overwhelming awareness of need that drove Jacob onto his knees. He was one who had always felt, I can cope. Now he knows he can't cope without God. And this is the first time we read of Jacob praying. So finally he's learning that strategy itself, strategy on its own, careful planning, careful plotting, it's not enough. The alarm is the context. And that leads us to look on the various elements of the prayer as we unpack these verses together. The first thing I would draw your attention to is the approach in prayer. The approach. Verse 9. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord. Notice the four capital letters, Lord. Jacob addresses God in a wonderful way. He uses the name Lord in the capitals. That is the covenant name of God. In other words, he comes to the one who has entered into covenant relationship with his grandfather Abraham and who has renewed that covenant promise to his father Isaac. And indeed he renews it to himself and has renewed it to Jacob Twenty years before. A. W. Pink in his book on Jacob says, Jacob was praying on the ground of a sure and established relationship. And this is absolutely crucial, of course. Jacob has come to know the Lord. That's why he came to him now in his hour of need. And so it is those who know the Lord, who have come into personal relationship with him, 
who come with confidence as children to a father in the time of need. So that's the approach. Secondly, and these are a series of items beginning with A. Secondly, the adoration in prayer. The adoration. Notice in verse 10 how Jacob speaks of all the kindness and faithfulness Lord you have shown. All the kindness and faithfulness. And uh, those are covenantal words. Kindness is covenantal love. Faithfulness is covenantal faithfulness. So he praises God as a God who keeps his promises. God is a God of loving kindness and tender mercy. God is a faithful God. And so he glorifies God. He praises God. He expresses his adoration. And this is a crucial aspect of our praying. Pouring out our hearts in adoration. If we need help, if we need to, as we say, prime the pump for prayer and seek to get adoration flowing, then we need a psalm. And it would be good to read a psalm as you come in prayer and turn it into your own expression of adoration the adoration and prayer thirdly the acknowledgement in prayer he acknowledges what God has done for him certainly materially in verse 10 he says I had only a staff a stick a walking stick when I crossed over this Jordan But now, look and see, I have become two groups. And here you see is that aspect of prayer that is wedded to adoration. And that is thanksgiving. Acknowledging God, the giver of every good and perfect gift. Lord, he says, thank you for what you have done for me. I acknowledge, he says, it's not my cleverness, it's not by my ingenuity, it was your blessing. And, uh, of course, one of the cures for a sense of disappointment is to count your blessings and to thank God for them one by one, and you'll be surprised. Twenty years ago, Jacob says, I had nothing. Now look what what I have been given. I have become two camps. That's a significant expression, isn't it? Jacob had used it in verse 1 when he spoke of the camp or the company of angels who were watching over him. He said, there's my camp with all the livestock, uh, with all the value that they bring. And uh, that's my camp. But then there's God's camp. And in God's camp, there are angels watching over me. And uh, so there's my camp and there's God's camp. Lord, thank you. For the way that you have kept and blessed me, he says, as he acknowledges God's goodness. Then fourthly, I want us to move on and think about the attitude in prayer. The attitude. In verse 10 there at the end of the verse, he uses the term, your servant. See how he puts himself in the servant's place. Now, he was a very important person at this time. He was the 
head of his clan, of his family. He has all this responsibility. He has these wives and children. And yet he takes the servant's place. And uh, he uh, says, you're my master. You're my Lord. I'm your servant. Jacob pronounces himself God's servant for the first time, says one commentator, because he had come to see that in God's program, growing means becoming smaller. Wasn't it John the Baptist who said, Jesus must increase, but I must decrease, because I, as a servant I have done my task. You remember how our Lord himself put it, if anyone wants to be first among you, he must be the last, and he must be the servant of all. As one writer says, greatness in Christ's kingdom is a gift that God gives to the humble. It is not a prize to be grasped by the proud. Yes, says Jacob, I am your servant, O Lord. Whatever you want, whatever you command, I will accept. And that includes the Lord's right to answer our prayers as he sees best. So, the attitude, I am your servant. Fifthly, I want us to think about the admission in prayer. He has something that he has to admit. And it's there again in verse 10. I am unworthy. Unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. Jacob has a keen sense of unworthiness before this God of such mercy and loving kindness. And so he humbles himself and he confesses his total undeserving. Lord, I am not worthy. One sometimes wonders, says A.W. Pink, if this is the reason why so many of us have no real power in prayer today. Certain it is that we must get down into the dust before God would pour out his blessing upon us and lift us up. We must come before him empty-handed. We must come before him as suppliants who feel empty, who need to be filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with that ripening fruit, his admission. I am not worthy. And so God comes to us and uh, we own up to our undeserving natures. And it's all because we want to receive from him the blessing that he has for us. But all the time we're saying we don't deserve any of this blessing. It was the attitude of the tax collector in the temple, you remember, when he stood away afar off and he kept his head down, there was no pride. Lord, he said, have mercy on me, the sinner. And this is the only way for us to come to God, acknowledging our sin, confessing our sin, seeking cleansing from our sin. And then we're ready to go on with our prayer. Jacob goes on. In the sixth place, the appeal 
in prayer, the appeal. We see that in verse 11. And there we read the words of Jacob. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. But Lord, you said, I will make you prosper and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. The appeal in prayer. I was reminded of Peter, who you remember managed to get out of the boat and come to Jesus on the waves. But then he began to sink, you remember, and he cried out, Lord, save me. And that's what Jacob says there, Lord, save me. Save me from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid. Yes, he admits his deepest fear to the Lord. He says, Lord, I'm afraid. I feel so weak. I feel so vulnerable. I know I shouldn't be afraid. Are there not angels standing guard over me? Yes, but I'm so weak. So I can only appeal to you, Lord, help me. It's an earnest, urgent appeal. And so we see that in prayer we come to petition. We come to the asking part of prayer. We come to the pouring out of our requests. But only after reverent approaching and adoration and acknowledgement and taking the attitude of the servant and admitting our sin. But then <clears throat> I want to see with you especially the final step in Jacob's prayer. And that is the argument in prayer. The argument in prayer. And we have it at the beginning and the end of the prayer. At the beginning of the prayer in verse 9, notice what Jacob prays. O Lord, you said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. And in verse 12, he says, Lord, I am afraid, but you have said, I will make you prosper and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. O Lord, who said to me, O Lord, who said to me, he repeats it. And so we can see there that the promise of God flanks the prayer on both sides. It's like brackets at the beginning and at the end. And why are they mentioned? Why are they there? Well, there are, they are reminders of the promise of God. It's really quite simple. He is pleading God's promises. And God cannot fail to keep his promises. The essence of Jacob's plea was this. Lord, you promised. And in the past, I have said before, we know from our own experience that this is a powerful, this is indeed uh, an unanswerable argument. If one of our children comes to us and says to us on a Saturday morning, Today, Dad, we are going to the park, aren't we? And you say, Sorry, I'm busy. 
But the child persists. And the child says, But you promised. And you remember, Yes, I did promise, didn't I? I'll have to go then, won't I? And you see, it's not as though God needs to be reminded of his promises because he's forgotten them, no. But his promises are the ground of our confidence in prayer. It's because God has promised that we persevere. Just think about an example or two very quickly. First of all, here's a loved one who has gone astray. Here's a child who's grown up in the congregation and has gone out into the world and is showing no interest in spiritual things. What are we to do? Well, of course, we're to pray for that loved one. And uh, how do we pray? Well, we say, Lord, you promised. You promised I will be a God to you and to your children. So, Lord, you promised. And we know that you will keep your promises and we can leave it there with God for his time, which is always perfect timing. So, in prayer, we appeal to God's promises. Take an example also of missionary work. Uh, Perhaps we feel that in missionary work, in outreach work, we're really up against it these days. And uh, perhaps we wonder, uh, should we carry on? Uh, are Are we getting anywhere? And then we remember God's promises. Go into all the world and tell the good news to every creature. And lo, I am with you always. So we say, Lord, you promised to bless mission work. And so help us to carry on with it. Help us to be faithful. In prayer, we appeal to God's promises. Roger Ellsworth in his book, Be Patient With Me, God Hasn't Finished With Me Yet. He talks about that business of the appeal to the promises. Jacob holds before God the promises that God had given. And yet we may have difficulty with this. If God has promised something, why do we need to pray for it at all? And the answer is that God delights in hearing his people remind him of the promises he made to them. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that helpful? God delights in hearing his people remind him of the promises he has made to them. This is the basis for confidence in prayer. While we may approach God with Any desire that is legitimate, we must remind ourselves that he is only obligated to do for us what he has promised. If we can find a promise and cling to it, we know that God will in due time answer our prayers. The appeal, or the argument rather, in prayer. Well, what can we say in conclusion? We see the after effects of prayer. In the difficult situation when everything seems to be going wrong, we are to come like Jacob and lay out our fears before the Lord and ask him to do what he has committed himself to to do in his word. And then, having left it all with him, we press on in faith. We face 
the Esau's of this world who have to be faced. And maybe we will discover, like Jacob, that when we finally confront the one whom we need to be reconciled with, things were not as bad as we feared. Things were not as bad as they could have been. God overruled it for good. We did the right thing, seeking reconciliation. And God, he brought it all about in a way that brought glory to him and blessing to Jacob and his family. May God help us in prayer. May we learn from Jacob's experience and Jacob's treasured prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this record of your servant Jacob who prayed. He was in great fear and distress. And uh, so we came to you, Lord. He approached in prayer. He came with adoration for all that you had done for him already, acknowledging your goodness. We thank you for that attitude of servanthood that he took. And we thank you for his humility when he admits, I am not worthy of the least of your kindness or faithfulness. Thank you for that appeal that he made. Lord, save me, for I am afraid. Lord, help me. We thank you, finally, for that argument in prayer when he said, Lord, you promised. And he claimed the promise. And having claimed the promise, he experienced your blessing. Help us, Lord, as we consider this fuller this evening. May we say with the one of old, I will trust and not be afraid. We ask in Jesus' name. The grace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be with you all. Amen.